So basically, I'm going to give a, a quick talk. Um, now, I am Scottish, so I apologize if I talk quite fast, but I've got a lot to get through, so I hope you can keep up. Um, basically, this talk is just going to be a bunch of tips and tricks for making the most of Docker in your sort of daily work in life and so on. Um, the tips are basically from people in the Docker Captain's program, which is you know, like the Microsoft MSV, MVP or whatever, um, and a few other places as well. Uh, yeah, so I'm a chief scientist at a company called Container Solutions. We do consultancy and training around Docker and containers and microservices. So um, come talk to me if you're interested in any of that. Um, I wrote a book called Using Docker for O'Reilly. Um, I'm also a member of the Docker Captain's program. If you want to get in touch with me, the best way is on Twitter. I'm at Adrian Moat on Twitter. Okay. Right, I've segmented these uh, tips up into a few different um, sections. So the first one's like daily, de daily development. So this is kind of tips that kind of help you day to day in Docker. So the first one, and the one that really annoys me about Docker, apologies to any Docker engineers here, is um, when you type Docker PS or Docker Container LS, it all goes off the end of the screen, right? Who's all had that? Yeah, everyone, basically. It's really annoying or it annoys me. However, you can fix it. If you pass the dash dash format flag, you can put in like a, a Go template, uh, and that controls what Docker PS outputs. So in this case, um, I said I want a table, um, and in that table I want three fields, the names field, the image field, and the status field. Uh, and suddenly, it all fits in the screen. So that's really quite nice. Now, obviously, you don't want to be doing dash dash format every single time you run Docker PS. That's not going to work. So I guess you could create an alias, like in bash rc or something. But the other thing you can do is uh, put it in your config.json. So there's a .docker config.json file that contains all your settings. Uh, and there's a field you can add called PS format. Uh, and the, the value is just the, the same as the, the, the format. Uh, next top tip, um, and I see a lot of Docker beginners doing this, is that don't bust the build cache if you don't have to. So if you're using something like Node, or, or sorry, if you're using something like NPM, or you want to install like Python uh, pip modules, you know, you've got the requirements.txt that define some modules, or in NPM, you've got your package.json. What you want to do is copy that over at the start separately from the rest of your source code and then run the, the npm install or the pip install. Uh, and that way, because you copy it over separately, um, if a file in your source code changes, it doesn't bust these two lines. If you do this, what will happen is any change to your source code will cause the npm install to rerun even if you haven't changed your package.json, which slows everything down hugely and is really annoying. So do that. Um, file mounting got you. Um, so I think it was Marcus that helped me on this one. Um, this one surprised me the other week. So if you mount a single file as a volume, not a directory, a single file, um, it might not work quite as you expect. So in this example, I've got an index.html, uh, and it says Moby rules. Um, if I mount that as the file user share nginx HTML, index.html in an nginx container, um, you know, it works as we expect. We can curl it, and we get the output Moby rules. So that's cool, but we're in Gordon's theater, so we want to update it to say Gordon rules. Um, so I open up Vi or Emacs or whatever, um, well, file editor, um, and I change it to say Gordon rules. However, when I curl localhost, it still says Moby rules. Now at first, you might think, well, that's just some caching issue, but it's not. The problem is like a volume mounted at the sort of inode level, the file system level, but not mounted at the path level. So a lot of editors like Vim and Emacs, what they do when you um, edit a file is they'll save out to a new inode and update the path to point to the new file. And the problem is your Docker container has mounted the old inode. So it never sees the new file. Um, so what you want to do 99% of the time is don't mount a file. What you actually want to do is mount the parent directory. Um, if for whatever reason you do want to mount a single file uh, and you want to edit it on the host, um, one thing you can do is like copy over the top of it. So I might you know, copy out and edit a new version and then copy that back over, and that won't change the inode. Or you can overwrite using like a, you know, the arrow key. Um, cleaning up. So a couple of um, Docker versions ago, we got the, the prune commands. So if you're old school Docker, you probably remember doing things like uh, uh, docker ps-aq to get all the IDs and piping that into Docker RM. And then you to get dangling images, it was something like Docker images, dash, dash, format, dangling, or something annoying like that. Um, but it's a lot easier now. So for example, to get rid of all your dangling images, dangling images are those ones that say, you know, you type Docker images or Docker image LS, and you get all these none things that look a bit weird. Uh, and that's caused by like a, when you update a tag. 
So the old image that used to point that tag now, long, now no longer has a name and it becomes none. Um, to get rid of all those images, um, you can run Docker image prune. So I did that on the plane on the way over and I saved myself 3.67 gigabytes. So I guess I hadn't run it for a while. Um, very similarly, you can do some like Docker container prune, we'll get rid of all your stock containers. Um, and Docker volume prune, we'll get rid of all your um, unused volumes, so volumes that are not attached to any container. Um, there's also Docker network prune, that'll get rid of um, networks without containers. Um, and I realized last night when um, Antonis told me, who's also a Docker captain, um, there's a system prune command, and you run that, it does all of them. Um, I would, however, emphasize that this is for like your development machine. You probably don't want to be running this command in production as you might break something. So just for cleaning up on your local computer. Container lifecycle. So I've got a few tricks here that I do with like a starting up and stopping of containers. Um, one thing you really want to do is make sure your, your containers start up dependently. You do not want your containers to require, have to go from this in a particular sequence. So quite often like your application may depend on another container like a, a database or something. Um, but if your application container comes up and its database isn't there, you don't want it to just crash. You want it to back off and wait for the database. And that way it won't matter what order your containers come up in. Um, yeah, so the easiest way to do that is in your application code, and I would stress, like if you can, do this in your application code uh, and not in a script. Um, you know, just back off and wait for your dependency. Uh, you, you know, you plug in exponential back off, so you'll wait for a second, if it's not there, wait for 10 seconds and a minute, blah, blah. Um, if you can't do it in application code, for example, you're using a third party binary, um, then what you can do is have a startup script, and your startup script will come up, and it'll wait for the database before it executes the application. Um, if you want to see more of that, um, check out the blog post, 12 Fractured Apps by Kelsey Hightower. Um, Kelsey's not a Docker captain, but he is like a bit of a guru in the container space, so I do recommend you check out his blogs and so on. At the other end of the scale, when you shut down your containers, so when like Docker stop happens, or you scale down a, a swarm service, or you drain a node or something, what happens is Docker sends um, a container a sig term signal to tell it to stop. If the container does not respond to that sig term within 10 seconds, it'll just send a sig kill and hard kill that container. Now, that's bad. And you really want your container to respond to the sig term because that means your application gets a chance to tidy up after itself. So it'll be able to like close network connections, uh, sockets and file handles, um, be able to write any last sort of data to file or database, um, and I'll be able to log what's happening. Um, and also, you know, you can probably do that in like a second or two, so you don't have to wait the full 10 seconds for the container to shut down. So that's very important. That does mean your application needs to be receiving signals properly. So for example, if you have a, a wrapper script that starts your application, uh, you need to make sure your application um, is then, it starts up your application as PID1, PID1 if it can. So using like exec to overwrite the process. So it starts as PID1, and that'll make sure your application gets any signals. Um, sometimes, however, you might have a, be running multiple processes in the container, or you might need like a, a management process that looks after your container. Um, and in that case, you can use something like Tinny. So Tinny is a very nice little utility that you can use to start up stuff. And it'll, it'll take care of forwarding signals to all child processes. And it actually also takes care of the, the zombie reefing problem if that's something you're worried about. Um, finally, if you use um, Node.js, um, be aware that NPM, if you start your, your application of NPM, that doesn't seem to forward signals properly for some reason that I never figured out. Um, and so you might want to use Node.js to start it. Um, yeah, and for more information on that, there's another Docker captain called Brett Fisher. So do check out his uh, blog, well, I think it's an article on GitHub, um, Node and Docker, good defaults. Health checks. So these are, used by, these are used by Docker to determine the health of a container. So I've got a very simple example here. I've got an Nginx container, um, and I've installed curl, and then we're running this health check command. Um, and this is used at runtime by Docker to determine the health of a container. So here we're saying, excuse me, here we're saying every 10 seconds, run this curl command. And all that's gonna do is hit the local host and check like the, um, the web page returns to the 200. And if it doesn't, it returns a one. Um, then if you, if you put that into your Docker file, the first thing you'll see 
as when you run Docker PS, you get a bit of extra information. So when your container starts up, you'll see health starting until it passes, um, I think it's maybe just one health check. Uh, and then once it's passed, it'll say healthy. Um, if it fails three consecutive, well, by default, three consecutive health checks, it'll be marked unhealthy. Um, and now these um, events are exposed by Docker in the event API. So if you have scripts, you can listen to them if you want. But also your orchestration platform like Swarm can use them and thereby you can stop rerouting re traffic to unhealthy containers. Uh, and you can also uh, you know, automatically restart unhealthy containers, for example. Okay, a couple of ones in security. Um, Read-only file system. So this is quite a very easy way, and it really does help a fair bit with security. It certainly makes an attacker's life a lot harder. So if you just pass this dash dash read-only flag, um, your container will start up with a read-only file system. Uh, and you know, that means you can't write to any file at runtime. So for example, if an attacker comes along and tries to deface your index.html, um, he won't be able to, or she won't be able to. Um, however, I realize you know, most applications do want to write to file. Um, so what you can do in those cases is sort of poke holes in the read-only file system by using volumes. Um, in this case, I've, not, uh, I've used, actually used um, tempfs mounts, which are almost like volumes, but not quite. And the reason I use tempfs mounts is because um, they get tidied up afterwards. If I used the volume, I'd, I'd have to remember to delete the volume after I finish using it. So um, I've got a tempfs mount for var run, so Nginx can write out its um, nginx.pid file, uh, and also the, the var cache Nginx folder. Um, one of possibly the, the number one mistake that, that people make when running Docker in production is they run as root, right? So you, you know, your, your containers are, are running as the root user in production, and that's not good. Um, I guess the reason people do it is because by default, you know, your Debian and CentOS containers are configured to run as root. I mean, the reason for that is because the first thing you want to do in a container in a Docker file is generally install some software, so you need to be root. But when you run containers in production, you really want to change your less privileged user. There's two reasons for that. Um, one, um, users aren't namespaced by default. There is work ongoing into like user namespacing, and you can enable that. But that's a whole different talk. You can talk to another captain called Philestes if you, if you want to find out about that. But by default, um, users are not namespaced. What that means is that if you're root in a container, that's the same user as root in the host. And the problem with that is if an attacker gets in uh, and they break the process, um, and they're running this root in the container, and a container breakout, they manage to break out of the container, they will then be a root on the host. And clearly, you know, that's game over. So don't run your containers as root. And also, you know, it just gives an attacker too many privileges within the container itself. You wouldn't run your applications in the VM as root, so don't do it in a container. Um, the way to avoid running as root is just to add this, uh, this user statement. And that will change user uh, to the named user from that command on in the Docker file and also when the container starts up. Um, and yeah, I've used like a standard um, Linux notation to create a user and group at the top there. Um, if you don't want to create a user, you can quite often use the, the nobody user, which is an unprivileged user that's defined in most uh, Linux distributions. Um, however, sometimes you find that when your container starts up, you want to do something that requires uh, more privileges. So for example, if you look at the, the Redis or the MySQL official images, you'll see they want to do a ch own command at runtime. Um, so when they start up, they have an entry point script. And in the entry point script, they, ch they, they change to an unprivileged user to start the actual like, Redis process or whatever. Now, you could do that with sudo. But there is a problem with using sudo. Uh, and we can see it here. Uh, I've got a Debian image with sudo installed. And when I run sudo and my, as a user nobody, and I run this psaex command, we can see I actually end up with two processes. One being the sudo, and one being the actual command that it runs. And that's kind of annoying, because in a container, I really only want one process. So there's a Docker engineer called um, Tianan, created a utility called Gosu. Um, and you can see I've got a Debian image of Gosu installed here. Um, and this time, I can run Gosu, change the nobody to the user, and run my command, and this time I only end up with one process. So there you go, that's a top tip for running, um, changing user at runtime. Oh, that's about it. Um, 
if you want more information on all of these, um, I've got a bunch of uh, references here. So you can go and grab all those, that stuff there. I think um, I've also got, I think all the slides will be made available later. Um, also, I think there's like a voting for all these presentations. Is that right? So if you go to the, the Docker coin app, app, you can like vote for these presentations. So if you like this, please go and vote for it, and maybe I get to talk again. Right. Thank you very much.